All right, welcome everyone. So for now, uh, I'm going to hand over to to Hank Bowman, and I believe we're going to be starting off with a with a introductory video. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think the video will tell quite a lot. The plastics that's already in the ocean, and that's millions and millions of tons, they might remain there for 400 years, and we're adding millions of tons every year. So this is a problem that we're going to sit for for many, many decades, if not centuries. Uh, this project is about uh, the investigation of persistent organic pollutants, mercury and plastics in the Indian Ocean. What we're basically looking at is to see if the marine debris that's in the oceans, and there's about 3 to 10 million uh, tons of plastics entering the ocean every year, um, whether the circulating plastics is being scrubbed from the ocean by the islands, and specifically coral reef islands in the Indian Ocean. Now the persistent organic pollutants are picked up by the plastics as well as the mercury, and then transported in concentrated form uh, on an oceanic scale. But when it gets into the beaches of the islands, it reconcentrates because we get a lot of the debris accumulating on uh, these beaches. The, the more and more small plastics you have, the bigger problems we will have. Because these plastics, big pieces break down in smaller and smaller pieces. So one piece becomes 10 pieces, 100 pieces, 1,000 pieces, and it all adds up. The small pieces of plastic also have system organic pollutants and mercury in them, and that can then be transferred to humans that eat them. So there's quite a concern about that. Of course, the same microplastics are also being taken up by fish and corals and so on, and that's what we're going to investigate and uh, then see if the pollutants are being transferred from the plastic into these organisms. And we don't really know the, all the effects. Um, we have a number of reports out um, uh, regarding microplastics in the environment and the impacts on it, but much more work needs to be done. And that's part of the work that we're doing here at the moment. This project looked at, looks at the global aspects of waste management because the waste and the debris that we pick up on the beaches of those islands come away thousands of kilometers away from where they are actually being used and released. And these islands in the middle of nowhere now sit with the problem of accumulated waste. And it might also affect the coral reefs and coral reef ecosystems in that island. And we don't know. So this is a global scale sort of intervention that's needed. There's going to need the um, cooperation of civil society, governments and industry uh, because a lot of the plastics are single-use plastics, they end up in the ocean. We've seen lots of the stuff on the, on the beaches. And um, if you don't do something about it on a big scale, then it's not going to have any impact on a local scale. Uh, it, it seems to be coming up now. Okay. It, it's up. We can see it. Okay, thank you. So good morning again, everyone. And um, I'm going to talk about you know, what you've just heard in the video. And I um, must say, it's been quite an enjoyable sort of experience on the one hand to work in these very, very nice and exotic places. Um, it's also dangerous, um, but it's very nice in any case to do to, to the sort of work. So there's a couple of people below that I'm mentioning. Um, there are more actually than these, but uh, these in particular I'd like to mention and thank. We're doing this in collaboration with University of Mauritius because the islands we're visiting are actually from uh, along the Mauritius, and I'll show you where they are now. So this is Madagascar over here. Africa, of course, is to the to, to the west. Reunion, you know, it's the French uh, department, but uh, here's Mauritius. And then about 450 kilometers away to the east is Rodrigues, a small island um, and a beautiful, beautiful coral reef around it. If you really want to go on a holiday, go there. I can really yeah, uh, recommend it. Over here is St. Brandon's. It's a small coral reef atoll or part of it. And um, this is where we have done most of our work. And only very few people live there and it's only temporary people. Um, so. All the contaminants and whatever we pick up will, uh, you know, comes from elsewhere. Oh, here's Agalega. It's a thousand one hundred kilometers north of Mauritius. 
And these are quite long distances uh, that you have to travel and you get all sorts of problems with storms and things like that and broken GPSs and getting lost in the ocean, uh, which in itself is fun afterwards, not during it. Uh, most of the work we've been uh, doing is actually from uh, St. Brandon's. Yes, yeah, St. Brandon's, you can see a Google, um, Google Earth photograph here. It used to be part of a huge um, atoll. Uh, we believe the western part has sunk away. So this is the lagoon here, over here. And here, the black over here is actually dry land or dry sand in all cases. And some of these are very, very small, sometimes actually uh, covered by ocean. Um, if, if there's storms, uh, Couzron, for instance, uh, has habitation. And every now and again with a storm, the people there, the two fishermen there, will have to sit on the top of the roof of the building. There are outlying islands, Albatross Island there, huge colony of city turns. North Island, very interesting bird compositions, and then some of the others as well. Um, but it's quite beautiful. We've done research there on the birds, uh, as well as uh, um, turtles um, you know, that occur there. And we have counted more than a million birds occurring uh, at, on this island and breeding on this island. And quite a lot of turtles also used it um, for breeding uh, in the sand there. These are some of the articles that have come out uh, from our research uh, since we started this. And as you can see, uh, a lot of my work is on pollutants, um, both metals and persistent organic pollutants. And we found them uh, where we looked, but in most cases, they are very, very low. So this is one of the cleanest islands you can think of, which is good in itself. Uh, for a number of reasons, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, we have to concentrate eventually on uh, plastics, but all these you'll see uh, occurring also in plastics. And as uh, Betty Cormier last uh, week uh, showed, um, there's a lot of pollutants already in the plastics um, that can be or may be transferred to the environment. You may have gathered from the um, video that I'm very interested in, do the pollutants in the plastics actually transfer um, to uh, the environment in a situation like this because the islands scrub the plastic that circulates and um, the pollutants in there might then eventually find a way into birds or fish or coral. And that's why we looked at them there as well as in the plastics, but to figure out the, um, if it really happens, it's quite, an, uh, uh, it's quite difficult. So, it's a beautiful place. Uh, there's a red-footed booby. Uh, the birds are quite calm and tame there. And um, they, you know, uh, they allow you to get really close. So you get some beautiful shots. Um, for instance, like this, beautiful beaches. Um, but please note on this beach is no plastic, but it's because of the aspect of the beach itself and um, how the currents work and deposit the uh, plastics on these beaches. You can see some more. These um, mounds here are actually from ghost crabs. But in many places you start getting this and this and so forth. So we, we went there uh, initially just to do the uh, bird counts. Uh, we took the forms along to do the plastics. We didn't expect to see so many plastics in an island that's so isolated from anywhere else. And when you look at um, the, um, the composition, you'll see that about a quarter of that is actually flip-flops. And, um, and it's quite a lot of them as well. So if you take the entire shoreline of the islets and islands there, uh, you get about 0.75 pieces of plastic per, per meter shore length. And then we didn't count the plastics that got stuck in here. So these plastics are actually scrubbed from the ocean itself and then they lie there and then 
this is coral rubble, you get um, a lot of um, abrasion and then microplastics forming. And that's one of the things we're looking at at the moment. You can see a check of a, a fairy turn and uh, there's a there's a flip flop right behind it. So the organisms there occur in quite close um, uh, to the vicinity of the um, plastics themselves. Lots of uh, floating nets as well that you find there. These are prey, of course, as well. So you get fibers. And um, yeah, it's just shocking to see that there. And it's not much you can do about it. There's no infrastructure on the island to actually manage uh, this um, uh, waste that piles up there. And very often with storms, it washes away again and then it kind of picks up again. And But also a lot of the stuff then gets uh, trapped in the sand itself. Here you see that the different islets all have different compositions or various compositions of different kinds of plastics. So the green is plastic and we count the glass and other stuff as well. There's also foam in here. And um, it depends on the islands and uh, the location and the currents and so on, what you find on each of these. So we had to walk all of these islands, which was quite fun. Um, and uh, yeah, to, to just walk around in the middle of nowhere, on, uh, on these sandbanks is really fascinating. Uh, we published this article, a flip or flop boutique. You find a lot of flips and flops, uh, but not a pair, of course. And um, this is getting nicely cited as well. We also collected plastics uh, for analysis. And um, as Betty last week uh, said, there's pollutants in there. Um, uh, these are PCBs, pentaproliferated for instance, which is industrial chemical. And you see uh, the plastics, uh, especially the plastics, have high amounts of these. Now, the plastics are not made with PCBs in them. There's no use for that kind of plastic. So these plastics have taken up the PCBs from the environment, from the water, and um, now transported this in high concentrations to uh, these islands. And when you look at the sand, for instance, here, and coral, and uh, also in the sand surrounding the bird colonies, you see uh, the PCBs actually in there as well. And the, the sand here to the right, uh, it's actually in the middle of the island, so it's not scrubbed. Uh, the PCBs are not really from um, the ocean itself, but uh, they must have been carried in one way or another, either via food um, or the plastics themselves uh, to the sand. Here you can see the perfluorinated compounds, uh, the forever chemicals that's shown in news uh, everywhere. Um, and even here, you see the same kind of uh, effect, you know, high levels uh, in plastics and still quantifiable amounts in the plast in, in other media from the same island, which is in the middle of nowhere. Another thing we noticed was these uh, fluorescent tubes. And uh, funny enough, we see, we saw quite a lot of these unbroken uh, on the islands themselves. So they seem to be traveling uh, quite long distances as well. The problem here is actually that the switches here contain mercury. And so this might be also a way for mercury to um, be transported long distances uh, in a concentrated, although very small amounts, but still concentrated form of mercury to very outlying islands. And we looked also at mercury in plastics. And lo and behold, we found some of the plastics have quite higher concentrations uh, of mercury in them and then variable amounts uh, in uh, the other media. Because this is not homogenous, you would expect if it was a background or something like that, you would have an homogenous sort of um, pattern here. It's not, so we believe that mercury, the mercury we're picking up here is not from background, but also from um, stuff being carried in either via plastics or via the tubes that we see there. Uh, this is a difficult sort of slide, but uh, what it means is that the compositions of the different media don't overlap. So there is, we think, a, a transfer from uh, plastics or from wherever 
to the um, media uh, in the islands, especially the coral stuff and the sand. So do plastics, uh, do, does plastic act as a um, uh, conveyor of pollutants to these islands where they then would reconcentrate um, pollutants on these islands? We're not certain yet. Uh, many plastics actually um, trap these pollutants, especially the pops, for instance, very strongly and they don't go out. Uh, Betty referred to that last week, and there's some of them that actually in uh, stomach contents uh, will leach out and then contaminate the, um, uh, the animals. But in other, in, in, in other cases, it stays there and remains there. My question has always been these plastic pieces because of abrasion um, become smaller and smaller and eventually it's so small that the molecules of, you know, especially the pops and then metals um, would have to go out and it's sort of a time bomb ticking away. Eventually it will come out again. You get a certain sort of uh, parallel with uh, glaciers. Glaciers have uh, trapped pollutants over um, the history of man. But now when they're melting, they're actually releasing these things and you get in certain areas, even in Europe and in, in ice lakes, you get spikes of uh, pollutants being released from the glaciers. The other thing that we were very interested in was uh, looking at stuff in, um, in, in bird eggs um, to see if we can find the pops in there and metals in there. And uh, so you will have to walk around in these huge colonies. There's a suit turned colonies um, and they lay the eggs here. So it's actually quite easy to pick up the eggs, um, analyze them. And then we find the same sort of um, pollutants uh, in these eggs here. You can see the, uh, the, the, the PCBs over here and, and some of the other chlorinated um, chemicals. And these are actually then either transported or taken up by the birds via either from ingestion of plastic, plastics or the food ingesting the plastics or the food themselves accumulating that from the environment. But as I've said, the, the concentrations in the eggs are actually quite low. So it's a very good sort of barometer for global pollution because if you look at it in places where there's high, there are high pollution, you will um, you won't see any dramatic changes very quickly. But here in background conditions, you will pick them up. You've all seen these horror stories and horror pictures of uh, plastics and the interactions with biota. Here's a piece of the flip flop and, and the other pieces of plastic and a rope and the turtle didn't make it. Uh, but then also the birds uh, use plastics in the nests and we didn't anticipate that but when walking around and keeping your eyes open uh, you start noticing these things and uh, we started collecting plastics that were collected uh, by the birds. These birds collect nesting material not from the island itself or from the dry land but they go and pick it up in the ocean as it starts floating in. Uh, in. They use uh, both algae um, and also then the plastics that they pick up. And we analyze these. Here you can see an egg, and this is a syringe that was picked up by one of the noddies. Uh, sorry, it was, uh, yeah, it's common noddies uh, that, that you see there. This is also a nest. And then you start analyzing it, and you can see it's polypropylene. Um, and, Quite a host of different kinds of plastics uh, that we picked up that the birds uh, have put in the nest. When you look at different kinds of plastics in the nest and you compare it with what's found on the beaches, uh, the stats say that it's statistically not significant, but it's so close to significant it's um, the difference that there is a difference between what's on the beaches and what is on the uh, in the nest. So the birds select different kinds of plastics than what is available uh, floating in. So they seem to select in one way or another uh, the kinds of plastics that they use. And as you've seen, a lot of them are fiber, fibrous type of materials like ropes. And this would be over here. We actually still need to do a number, a little bit of more work in there, in there. So we have to probably go back again and do some more collecting. Uh, you also know that birds, ugh, that, that fish, 
we have plastics uh, from the uh, food or directives from the water. That's not that that's just an illustration. So whatever eats the uh, fish will also ingest the plastics. And again, not participating when walking through here. When you start looking here, this, these are the nests. They just scrape, so they do nothing else. So they don't carry in, the, the sooty terns don't carry in any material from the ocean. They just scrape it and lay the eggs and uh, then feed the chicks there. But when you walk around and you start looking, you see small pieces of plastic actually uh, right in the scrapes. And um, like, like here, you can't see the plastics, but this is just an illustration of what a scrape is. Uh, this is a wing of a dead chick. Um, but when you collect the sand from these scrapes and you analyze them um, using uh, through, um, FTIR, uh, you get all kinds of plastic. These are small bits and pieces of the plastics, and they're very, very small. And our contention is that actually the birds carry the plastic in via the food, uh, via the small fish that they catch, or other stuff that they catch, and then feed to the chicks. And that's how the plastics then get transferred from the ocean back on land again, um, and then contaminating the land. And whatever is in the plastics, then these very small plastics then could leach, of course, into the chicks. Yeah, you know, some of the fragments that we found, they're very small, um, and uh, polypropylene and PVC and others seem to dominate, not PVC though. You know, the colors, and we thought that there would be some sort of selection for colors, and my initial guess was that it would have been blue, but you can see each nest, each scrape has a very different composition from the others. Um, so again, it shows that because the background, if it was background, just stuff blown in from the ocean, it would have been much more homogeneous, which is not the case here. And uh, you can then see that the, it's either different kinds of fish that they eat or the fish select uh, differently. We don't know, but this, the, uh, this is how we believe the plastic then get from uh, the ocean by the fish then the fish being caught by the birds in the ocean, sometimes 200, 300 kilometers away from the islands, flown back uh, and then fed to the chicks. And this is what you get there. The other work that uh, Michelle is worked on, uh, working on at the moment is on microplastics in the ocean itself. Okay, this is not the Indian Ocean, but it's a good picture that we found. It's, um, uh, this is working on um, the research, of, oh, I forgot the name, S.A. Gallas. And uh, on one of the cruises um, along here on the eastern shore of Africa, uh, they did collections uh, via this machine here, and then analyze it. And these were the uh, sites where water samples were collected 20 meters and 100 meters deep at each site. Uh, we divided in roughly two big patches, the north and the south. Uh, and the current actually comes from the east then divides into north and south over here. Um, here's the Comores, is Mozambique, Tanzania, there's um, Zanzibar. So we didn't expect to find what we found, but this is what we got uh, in the water itself, lots of fibers, small plastic particles, etc. Um, and these were filtered on 0.25 micron. Uh, two five microns, sorry, two five micron sieves. And uh, the, these are the ones that got stuck. So the smaller ones will go through and it's probably missing quite a lot of that already, but um, you know, you have to get it out of the matrix in one way or another. When you compare north and south, these are the numbers. Uh, so the south current um, has a significantly higher number of particles than the north current. We're not exactly sure why. Uh, we looked at all sorts of factors like um, distance from land and distance from habitation and, and the presence of harbors and things like that, or uh, feeding from uh, rivers, but we couldn't find a reason why these two differ. When you look at fiber, this is all microplastics. When you switch it up into fibers, you can see that uh, the fibers are actually much higher in the um, northern current than in the southern current. But if you look at the fragments, they're exactly the same. So the differences in composition is actually to be uh, seen here in the fibers. So there's somehow 
uh, at connection with fives rather than fragments. What struck us also was that the, uh, the, the when you when you look at the sizes and the colors and things like that, it's pretty homogeneous between the two. And um, that means, or we think that uh, what it means is that the ocean has been so polluted by now that it's quite homogeneous. You won't see, you know, if there's a, a storm or whatever that washes stuff in the sea, the background of microplastics in the ocean is already so large that you won't really see it change. And that is quite concerning because this stuff is now everywhere. We didn't find any association with depths. So this is microplastics uh, numbers, for instance, um, with, um, with depths between 20 meters and 100 meters. There are no correlation or no differences there as well uh, between any of these comparisons. And um, this is for the northern uh, current and this is for the southern current. And so even at 100 meters, you would expect differences to, to, to be there. Um, and didn't find any. Uh, fibers might uh, take some longer time to sink out than um, in, in, in deep water than in uh, shallow water. It's the only thing that really suggests that some things might be happening here. Uh, while we were uh, doing our surveys there uh, in Agalega, there's a small population, about 300 people. And uh, we took the opportunity to uh, give them a briefing um, in, on what we're doing there. Uh, this is, again, the, the microplastic of plastics and there's a fish. And just for illustration's sake, so and hear the people. And this is being translated into Creole um, because they don't understand English really very well. I can't speak French um, nor Creole, but um, our senior diver could from Mauritius uh, could do that. So we actually reached quite a huge proportion of the population um, uh, with these briefings that we did there. Something else that happened and uh, that we didn't anticipate was uh, wrecks. Um, this is uh, one of three pieces of a recently wrecked uh, shipping um, ship uh, vessel. And um, we were told about it and we decided going to have a look and we did. And then you see this yellow stuff over here. Now, this is polyurethane foam. And if you rub polyurethane foam, you get incredibly high numbers of particles and which is very easily, uh, which is very abrasive or can be abraded very, uh, abraded very easily. And as the storms come in and uh, shift the stuff around, this will then also enter the water. We didn't anticipate to find a local source of these kind of polyurethane foam particles, and we didn't look for them. They're a bit difficult to track and analyze. Uh, and so again, we have another reason to go back and have a look again at this. What we did see was all the underwater uh, debris that's there. This coral is all dead. We did a separate paper, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but this coral is all dead because of the oil and, and, and all sorts of other things that, um, that come off the boat. And um, you get a totally different kind of fish population over here, but you can see here, there's already debris in the water. Here you can see wire. It's all getting stripped uh, from the insulation. So this is another sort of local source we, we didn't anticipate of what's happening here. And now we're trying to look at what's happening with the microplastics in the coral. But the problem is you have to collect the stuff for the purposes that you're gonna use them for, and we didn't anticipate that. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, here's Veronica and she's sampling coral and we did the coral for, uh, analyzed the coral for both uh, pops and uh, metals and we found um, they both had them, so just like, and, and the possibility would be that all the plastics on land eventually leads, uh, leaches the pops into the, and metals into the sea, uh, where it's been taken up by uh, the coral. Now the big thing is to find the plastics in the coral and then make that link, which we're not yet uh, done with. Now, let's go back to a, a larger scale. And then what we have done in terms of uh, globally uh, of getting this um, plastics issue uh, in, uh, on, noticed on a higher level. 
I'm particularly proud of this uh, report over here. Uh, it was in 2010, I think, it came out, and this was brought to United. This is, this is by the Global Environment Facility, working through the World Bank, etc., which is a UN organization. And this then was a, uh, eventually presented to United Nations, and huge amounts of funding, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, have already from because of this report already flown uh, into preventing. Uh, pollution, land-based pollution. Uh, here, a couple of other uh, reports that we that also mentions or addresses um, microplastics and plastics in uh, the ocean. So this is quite nice to get this out and get some sort of reaction and hopefully have some sort of effect on a global scale. Uh, you might know that Junior. Uh, United Nations Environmental uh, Assembly we just finished in Nairobi, and. Um, I'm very glad that uh, they've, which we uh, we supported it very much, and about 30 or 40 scientists, including some of uh, the SST, supported that in a letter to the minister, and for uh, establishment of a science policy panel that will address global pollu or pollution on a global scale. This would be equivalent to say the IPCC or IPBS for biodiversity. So now we have a third panel uh, that will eventually be uh, established to advise governments in the UN on the large scale sort of interventions that can be taken. Um, and uh, this we hope will have quite some impact. We of course have a lot of other issues in the world at the moment. Uh, there's a war on, so that takes a lot of effort away from uh, these sort of things, and money away. But at least that is so, uh, some sort of um, you know good support to have. I also noticed the comment by the American Chemical Council highlighting the role of plastics in COVID response, as well as the threats posed to plastics and waste management, bioplastics and waste management. So even the industry is now um, acknowledging that there's a huge problem. Um, we've seen also similar uh, signals from the African plastics industry. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Hank. Uh, it's it's really interesting to hear about the work that you've been doing, uh, especially after last week, hearing about uh, Betty's research with uh, fish larvae. It's interesting to hear about the impact on on birds as well. Um, I, I just ha uh, I have a few questions. I, I don't see any that have come through in the chat yet, um, but you're welcome. Any for our attendees, you're welcome to send those through in the chat or the Q and A box. Uh, while they're coming through, uh, you mentioned obviously the presence of pollutants on the shells of the bird eggs. Have any studies been done linking um, the presence of pollutants to uh, the rates of uh, sorry to declines in hatch rates? Yes and no. Uh, we looked because we, you know, there's so many birds, so you don't really restrict it by number of eggs, which normally are in the terrestrial uh, um, setting. And we looked at uh, eggshell thinning, for instance, which is uh, one of the causes of uh, failure, uh, breeding failure. And uh, although the levels of DDE, which is very strongly associated with eggshell thinning, even though the levels are very uh, low, we still see an effect on eggshell thickness. So even if, uh, an increase in DDE is associated with a uh, decrease in uh, more thinner eggshells. Whether that would translate into any sort of impact on the, uh, on the embryo uh, or embryonic development within the egg, we don't know. Um, what we have done, uh, separate from this, is another study on uh, penguin eggs. And we looked, uh, we found about 30 to 35 percent, if I can remember correctly, thinning of eggshells associated with uh, persistent organic pollutants in there. And that is very concerning, of course, because the eggshell itself, you need uh, transfer of both gases and water. The eggshell has to get light, the egg has to get lighter and get rid of water uh, in, uh, for the embryo to develop and eventually hatch. And we looked at the um, if a finished shell would allow more water to go outside and therefore stress the embryo. And um, especially on a climate change sort of scenario, we will have higher temperatures. We're not sure what's going to happen with the humidity, but the uh, loss of water through finished shells at higher temperatures was dramatic. 
and that is quite a concern of course mm, certainly um it yeah definitely sounds like a, a a big concern with all the given um, sort of changes in terms of increasing pollution mm. and ver for variations in, in climates. Um, one of the, the graphs that you showed indicating the preference that birds seem to show for particular items of plastic, the fibrous kinds that they would, that would be found in their nests as opposed to the beaches. Is that linked to particular plasticizers or um, yeah, particular properties of those different uh, plastic items? I think they just select them because they may make uh, good nesting material. Um, you know, they pick them up, they fly low, low over the sea, and then they pick up all the stuff uh, from the sea and then deposit them in the, in the nest. And uh, there's quite a competition, actually. There's not, you know, you need to, a million birds, I guess, 50,000 pairs of noddies that actually use this. You can imagine that 25,000 nests would collect, you know, there's quite a competition to get the stuff from the ocean. Uh, and they'll pick anything that they can get them and place them in there. Okay, um, so so it's not linked or anything to sort of perhaps the the way the color leaches or or anything sort of linked to the no, property, more just available material yeah. for nest building. <laughs> Whatever is there and that's useful and they can get out of the ocean, I think they'll use that. I mean, uh, even the syringe, which was you know, it's quite an eye opener. You know, you stand there, it take, takes two seconds to register. This is a syringe. Uh, and you have to go back where the hell did it come from what did it do and why did the bird pick this uh, we don't know um, and these why don't, we don't know so you know that's a stuff of science and uh, i love it <laughs> it certainly sounds like there's a lot of a lot of room for further studies in in the area oh, you know <laughs> it, it is expensive though you know to get there it costs quite a lot of money you have to fly there and go out and get food and you have to buy French wine when you're in nurses. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, were, was most of the data, did it come from studies that were conducted um, as part of the particular project or did any of it come from sort of established uh, national research vessels like the Agullis or, or any of those? Um, well, there is, um, the Agullis was in a separate project. Uh, a couple of my students managed to get on board and uh, do the work. And I got very good feedback on how they work there. We're doing other work as well, for instance, metals in um, zoo plankton. See if we can get some sort of differentiation between different regions. And uh, even there, it's, it's very homogenous. So even if you look at background metal pollution or possible met metal pollution, it seems to be quite homogenous. But most of the work that I just spoke about is actually from the NRF Blue Skies application that I managed to get, uh, which is quite nice, although they cut my budget and I couldn't do everything that I wanted to do. Um, sorry, did you say the Blue Skies project? No. Okay, okay, interesting. Blue Skies is, uh, they don't have it anymore, but there you can test, you know, high risk, uh, high cost uh, projects. Um, and it was, it was quite nice to have. Okay, uh, and it just just for uh, perhaps people watching who who have less of a background in terms of uh, chemistry or or less familiarity with the persistent organic pollutants, um, can you perhaps elaborate a little bit on the origins of some of the PCBs and um, the perfluorinated compounds? Sort of uh, what they're used for, perhaps if they're kind of flame retardants or. or what their purpose yeah. is when they're added to the plastic products? Um, a lot of them are added to the product themselves. The plasticizers, we actually haven't touched upon those and the sand there and the you know, environment, they might be, might have quite a lot of plasticizers in there, especially if you look at the thousands of um, flip-flops lying around. The stuff that make the flip-flops flipping and flopping to make them soft is actually a plasticizer. And some of the uh, flip-flops can contain up to 25% plasticizer, which is not plastic, but then can leach out and become available. And I'm sure it's there. Some of them have been linked to plasticizers that have been linked to endocrine disruption. Um, then you have other stuff that's used for, as you mentioned, flame retardants uh, that can be added then to the plastics themselves. But if you find a plastic with everything in there, 
any possible bas uh, flame retardant in there, then it means, you know, they normally only add one, perhaps two of the stuff to the plastics, but now, now you get plastic pieces with lots of them, lots of different plasticizers, uh, flame retardants, or other actuals in there. It must be from the ocean. So it actually concentrates the stuff from the ocean into the plastics. And the big argument is, well, are plastics actually cleaning up the ocean? Because then they suck stuff out of the water, becomes less available for animals that um, swim through it, but then reconcentrated in stuff that can be taken in. And how much of that actually then transfers to the organism or in other ways affect the organism itself? I mean, we still have to think about the physical pres presence of the stuff, um, uh, the plastics itself in the ocean. So it's not the only argument against plastics in the ocean, there are more. But the, the, the pollutants, uh, including mercury, is to me is some sort of time bomb that's only going to increase. Uh, the more and more you scrap the ocean from the pops and mercury or whatever, eventually it will have to go out again uh, out of the plastic. So there's still a lot of questions up in there. Uh, the DDTs that we found and some of the other organic chlorine pesticides are not added to plastics at all. And again, those. Um, Get in the plastics itself. So, the one, some of the pieces of plastics we get, I think, yes, we've analyzed 60 different kinds of persistent organic pollutants in there that shouldn't be there. Now, the plastics then become a vehicle for transferring it over long distances, but it also protects it against sunlight and other sort of breakdown. And then deposit it on uh, isolated islands like this, where you might get a reconcentration of pollutants in there. And that, to me, is a big um thing to think about thankfully we didn't find a lot of the, the bird eggs itself uh didn't have high levels actually very low levels um but there are other things to look at for instance and might be struck by the coral so we did find pops and coral as well okay um that, that that's quite an interesting uh thought experiment I, I i've heard of uh i've heard of mentioned before where uh, microplastics and sort of plastics in general can act as sort of a way to remove persistent organic pollutants and other things from the environment uh, as a bit of a flocculent, I believe. But yeah, obviously, as you mentioned, they, they can act as sort of a source for them as well. So it's not necessarily a, a foolproof, foolproof plan no. for removing those. Yes. No. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A or in the chat, um, but if anyone has any questions at a later stage, you're welcome to, to email those through to us, um, as we said, at webinars at sstafrica.org.za, um, and we'll happily pass those along to Henk. Um, then we are nearly at our, our end time of 12 o'clock, and um, I just want to remind you all that we have a, another webinar taking place next week, which will be looking at plastic test textiles and fossil fashion. Um, so it'll be a, a bit of a, a change, <laughs> but um, I, yeah, before we close off, I just want to say thank you so much, Henk, for, for speaking to us today. It's really interesting to hear about the, the impacts of micro and macro plastics um, in the Western Indian Oceans um, and a, a, really, a really interesting follow on, fr follow on from last week's um, look at microplastics. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week. You can find the registration details for, for next week and the future webinars on our SST events page. Um, so from all of us at SST, thank you, Hank, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of thank your... Thank you, Tara. Enjoy the rest of your, your afternoons. Bye-bye.